Hello, Augies Worldwide. I'm Dave Kassler, amateur radio call sign KE0OG, here with Ask Dave episode 249. And today we're going to talk about the Radioddity GA510 radio. I was contacted by Radioddity and they asked if they could just send one more radio over, so they sent this one. Uh, it's a nice little uh, FM only radio, and so we're going to dive in and take a look at it. Lots of pictures. We're going to look at the radio itself, uh, some of its features, some of its quirks, um, the fact that you can program it from the front panel, which is very nice. It's made for that to be, quote, easy. Uh, you have to set different memory settings and so on. It'd be easiest just to write down a way to do it. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Let's talk about this radio. The Radioddity GA510 radio is available from Amazon via Radioddity. It's their online store there at $65. And that's enough that you can get free shipping out of that too. Uh, so it's a nice basic radio. It's FM only. It's not digital. It's not DMR or anything like that. It's just FM only. Now in the box is the radio, the antenna, two, count them, two batteries, a base charger, which I just, I'm going to say this several times, it's designed for 10 volts, not 12. So you've got to use the right power supply with it and not use it in your car. Now it also includes the charger, the belt clip, the wrist strap, which attaches to the belt clip, by the way, the programming cable, an earpiece with foam covering over the earpiece, and an owner's manual. It's a dual band on two meters or 70 centimeters. Uh, the power is uh, triple settings, one, five, and 10 watts. Now I would point out, beware of 10 watts. Your head is right next to the antenna. Uh, it has one watt of audio output, so there's plenty of audio output. It is dual watch. Any two channels, they can both be on the same band if, or on different bands if you want. Uh, dual watch is just a sort of a special way to scan between those two channels. Uh, there would be in the upper and lower position on the screen because it shows two frequencies on the screen which you can flip back and forth between. Now, uh, there are voice prompts available for uh, nearly everything, which is a very nice thing for somebody who has uh, vision difficulties or if you're doing this in a fairly dark place. Uh, it's interesting that the owner's manual includes a dire warning, including the threat of jail time. Uh, if you transmit outside the bands, you're authorized to use. Uh, the radio has scanning. Uh, in VFO mode, it will scan according to the frequency steps. And in memory mode, it'll scan your uh, memories. There are a couple unmarked key functions. Uh, for example, uh, the pound button starts scanning. Uh, let's talk a little bit about uh, power, power supplies. Um, the radio comes with two batteries, uh, standard. Now these, these batteries are um, mismarked. It says on the, the radio here that they're 3.7 volt batteries. They are not. These are your classic Chinese 7.2 volt batteries. And uh, when fully charged, it's about 8.2 volts. And the manual goes on to state that the uh, supply voltage is 7.4 volts. Uh, I think the battery mismarking is a safety issue that needs to be fixed on these batteries, maybe even to the point of encouraging users to go mark that out and put in the right voltage on that. Now, um, Radioddity does not sell a battery eliminator for this radio, so the only way to use it is with its existing battery. And that's why they give you two. You can be charging one while the other is uh, being used. Uh, unfortunately, of course, the charger, the little uh, charger thing, takes 10 volts, not 12. So you can't plug this in like to a cigarette lighter or a power plug or whatever they call them these days in cars. You need to plug it into 110. So if you have a little inverter, you can make 110 and then convert that to the 12. It's kind of Rube Goldberg, but it'll work. Okay. Um, 
Now you can charge one battery by itself in the charger. You can take the the battery, just the battery itself, and slip it in the charger like that and it will charge. So it doesn't have to be attached to the radio to charge. Um, and I mentioned again that 10 volt DC thing. That That is an issue. I don't know why they make these things with 10 volt chargers when the automobile is is 12 volt, but the little uh, wall wart that comes with this thing puts out 10 volts. So you're going to need to use that to charge the radio. Uh, the battery life uh, estimates, which are 96 hours using both batteries, is based on a three minute transmit, three minute receive, and a 54 minute standby per hour. That's a pretty light duty cycle. Okay, if you're out um, using this in the field or you're doing some public service work or something like that, that um, is a very light duty cycle. So your batteries will last less. Keep, keep one uh, charging. It's interesting, I think, that the manual says that you should remove the battery from the charger after it indicates fully charged. Um, this sounds to me like a potential safety issue because you just know that everybody at some point is going to forget that the battery's on the charger until they need the radio the next time and it could be on there for hours, even days. Uh, I don't know if this is an issue with battery life. Um, I hope it's not a safety issue. I hope we don't run into any problems of these things uh, getting overheated. Now, some observations uh, about the radio. Uh, the antenna connector is a male SMA. The antenna is a female SMA. This is kind of standard with Baofeng, Osheng, um, and so on. Uh, there is some sort of a weird little feature on this thing left over from the digital uh, models that they make, and that's this little SOS button right here. This SOS button will make uh, a kind of a... Welcome. Channel mode. Whoopee. Now, the thing is that that just transmitted it, that same stupid siren out on the air. Now, I don't know what good that does anybody, um, but it, it's there. It's a feature. It's a feature. Uh, the light on the top will turn uh, uh, green on receiving. Something breaks the squelch. Uh, red on transmit, otherwise it's off. Uh, there is an accessory jack, and uh, they do include a little um, earphone kind of thing. This has got a little push to talk on here, or you can do Vox. The accessory jack on this thing follows the Kenwood pinout. So you can use Kenwood style speaker mics, things like that with it. Uh, note that both the small plug and the larger plug are stereo plugs. So um, some of the older Kenwood equipment uh, on one of the jacks, it's just uh, mono jack, uh, but these are, these are stereo jacks. Um, regarding uh, wide versus narrow deviation, it'll do either wide or narrow. Note that amateur practice in the United States is wideband. Um, although in some very crowded areas it can be specified by a repeater owner to be narrow. This has to do with the bandwidth uh, used by the radio during transmitting. Wide versus narrow is actually the amount of deviation that the radio is set for, so normally you would use uh, wide in the USA. Now after you press memory you need to select the proper menu function and press memory again all pretty quickly or the system reverts to its normal frequency display. I had this happen to me many times when I was trying to program. I just had to learn to be menu, like menu one, one menu. Uh, and then it would bring up the options for that menu and then I'd pick those and press menu again to uh, put those options into place. It's something you just get used to with practice. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, it has a full DTMF keyboard. Um, touch tone, in other words, 
uh, on here, including the A, B, C, D. All those, those are different buttons to get the A, the B, the C, and the D. Uh, they're all there if you need that. Now, they used to be commonly used for auto patch. Auto patch has all but disappeared these days, but you can use this as part of identification or to open something or, you know, because there are little DTMF detectors that you can get that will hear the sounds and then do things according to how they're programmed. Now, um, note that when you push the key, you do not hear the DTMF sound. I did check, it does actually transmit that sound out uh, over the air, so um, it is there. Now, the fact that it has no feedback, you don't know whether you've pushed the key hard enough or maybe double pressed it or something like that. Now, there's a statement in the marketing literature that says that the radio can be used up to eight miles. Well, that's just marketing piffle. I was able to hit the Montrose repeater, which is over 20 miles away, just with the uh, rubber duck. Um, distance depends on everything, such as terrain, elevation, the amount of power used, the luck of the draw, the tides, phase of the moon. Um, it, it just depends. This has all the usual CTCSS tones. It also has a feature to listen for repeater transmitted tones, although most repeaters, uh, FM repeaters, do not pass the tones on uh, to the output audio, although some do, some do. And that's a handy feature because then you can set this thing up not to open the squelch unless it gets that CTCSS tone um, on, on the uh, channel of, of interest. Okay, the lower button provides a reverse, so you can hear what's being transmitted on the uh, repeater's input frequency. Let's see, it has an FM broadcast radio built in, uh, which is accessible through the, the top button. Um, you have to enter the frequencies directly though. There's no memories for the uh, commercial FM. Note that it tunes worldwide FM from 76 megahertz up to 108 megahertz. The US is 88 to 108 uh, megahertz, a, a 20 megahertz wide band. Uh, there are no channel memories for that. So you can just, um, you know, you might want to jot down the frequencies of your favorite FM. Uh, channels. You can usually get those off the internet very easily. Now, I want to talk about something that this radio has been specifically designed for, and that is front panel programming. You can program most everything about a channel, not everything. For example, you cannot program the name of the channel in there, but you can program just about anything else and do it from the front panel. This is very important for people who are working with ARES or RACES or auxiliary communications, which is shortened to OXCOM, which makes me think of a great big blue ox <laughs> uh, going down the road, but it's AUX, A -U -X, not AUX, O-X. Okay. Um, the radio interface really is designed to make it easy to program from the front. Now note, you program in the VFO mode, and not only in the VFO mode, but you have to use the top frequency. So you have to, the AB switch gets you to the top one, then you go into VFO mode, you input the frequency of the repeater output. In other words, the frequency you're going to receive on. Then you go use the menu to do things like set up the offset, which is 600 kilohertz or 00.600 um, in the US. And uh, the, the uh, 70 centimeter offset is five megahertz or 05.000. Okay, that has to be set. Then you have to set the direction of the offset using a menu command. And then you will use menu commands to put the right CTCS tone in and all of those things. And when you get it right, you're ready to put it into a memory. Now, a couple things about the memory. You cannot overwrite a memory that's already been written. 
you have to specifically delete that memory, make it go away, then you can write to that memory uh, your new information. Okay, so if you make a mistake in programming, you're going to have to delete that, go back, do it all uh, over again until you get it right. It is so much easier to program with a computer, but this radio is made specifically so you can program it from the front panel. Now, um, note again, you have to use the upper frequency uh, in order to do that. To program a channel, start in VFO mode. Select your desired receive frequency, which is the repeater's output frequency. Then use the menu system to configure the what the manual calls finer details of the uh, channel you're trying to program, such as transmit power, uh, bandwidth, which is the wide or narrow, CTCSS, which are the subaudible tones, and so on. So yes, you can program a repeater from the front panel, and I did it just to prove to myself that I could do it. I programmed our local flat top repeater, which is 20 miles away uh, by air uh, in Montrose, and was able to uh, get it to come back to me. In fact, even from the desk here, it would come back to me, but if I stood on the front porch, it would be very nice and crystal clear. And now there's an RX tone and a TX tone. And in this case, TX refers to this radio, the radiotity. So the tone that goes out that the repeater wants to receive has to be set up in the transmit tone or TX tone here. Oh, when you're setting that tone, it's sometimes easier rather than entering it directly to just keep pushing the up arrow or down arrow until you get to the right uh, tone for that. Then you switch to channel mode and delete the memory that you want to use, okay? Note, memories cannot be modified or overwritten. You must first delete it if it has any contents. Then once cleared, go back to the VFO mode, use the menu system, and here is where the manual will lead you astray. There are no instructions in the manual on how to write what's in the, VF, uh, the VFO to the memory channel or what's in frequency mode to the channel mode. However, what you do is you select menu 25, menu, choose your channel, and then menu again. And it puts it uh, into there with all of its attributes, okay? Now, the description in the book for menu 25 states almost exactly opposite of what it does, okay? And the instructions for how to program a repeater do not include the step I just gave you. It took me a little while to figure that out. Okay, um, now let's talk about computer programming, okay? Uh, computer programming is oh so much easier. Now, it comes with a programming cable. Okay, it's got the Kenwood thing on one end and it's got the USB on the other. Notice this is big and fat. There's a reason for that. The chip's in here, okay? Um, and you're going to, what I did was I downloaded the programming software from radioddity.com, go to support, and then pick the radioddity radios, and then pick uh, this radio, the GA510, okay, the GA510. By the way, this is the only place the model number appears. Also, it will appear if you take the battery off, which takes a little doing. The model number is right in there too. But it's not on the face of it anywhere. Strange. Okay. Somebody asks you what model you have, you either got to remember or open it up. Okay. Um, there is a 10. Now, when you download the software, there is or there are several things in there. There's a driver for Windows 7, 8, and 10. Uh, if you're still using 7 or 8, you shouldn't be. You need to be moving to 10, but it's, it's there for them. And then there's um, a 10-page instruction manual on programming. And then there is uh, the software itself. Now, the... Um, 
uh, which has to be installed. Now, the first thing you want to do is unpack that because it comes down as a zip file and then go in, to, you know, and, and it, it will extract all the files. Go in there and without having attached anything, load the driver. When you're done loading the driver, put the USB end into the computer and then go to start, right click on that, pick device manager, go into device manager and then pick COM ports. Okay, and there should be a COM port there. Uh, on mine, it was number three. There should be a COM port there that will be the one that you use. Jot the number down, you'll need it. Now, after you have done that, plug this, uh, turn the radio off, plug this in here. It'll go in upside down. I'll show a picture of that. It'll go in upside down, and then when you have it in, turn the radio on with the volume about halfway, okay? It's using some of the audio circuits in there a little bit to do this, um, to get everything in and out, but just turn it up a little bit. Now, I have noticed, and people have talked about these radios, sometimes transmitting a little something while they're being read from or written to. And that has been my experience with this too. So I'd put it on an unused channel um, that's for some off the wall frequency in the ham band. Um, and then uh, go ahead and do the uploading and download. Now you will have to put in that number of the COM port. It will try to choose a number. Uh, as it turns out, the ICOM 7300 was on COM 9 and this was on COM3. It tried to do COM9, which wasn't going to do anybody any good, so I had to manually set it to COM3. There's a menu item up at the top for settings. Now there are three possible screens that you can get up. One is the frequency chart, another is all the other settings chart, and another that uh, sets the range of the radio, and it does not have a setting uh, that we would use uh, here in the United States. So you just leave it at its widest setting. Okay, so um, the radio uh, comes with something like 20 odd channels programmed. They're programmed for really off the wall stuff. But what they're really programmed for is when you look at the list in the software, you can see all different kinds of examples of doing things in the software. There's a button down at the bottom that says erase. If you hit that button, it erases everything. Not just the line you've selected or anything like that. Now, you're going to have to uh, hit that button before you start putting your own programming in so you can get rid of all that factory stuff that they have in there that's just examples. Um, I just programmed in the Montrose repeater and then I programmed in the local weather radio. 162.45, okay, megahertz. Now, you have to put something in the transmit frequency. So here's what I did. I just picked a, an off-the-wall, inside the handband frequency. I think I picked 146.000, okay? And then I also turned on the busy channel lockout. So that means, if you select that, what that means is if the channel you're listening to has somebody on it, you will not be able to transmit on top of them. That's a very good idea. So if you're listening to the weather radio or somebody is and they hit the push to talk button, it's not going to send out a signal. So that's a good way to get around that. Now, uh, when programming the repeaters, um, you do it a little differently. When you're programming from the front panel, you put in the receive frequency, the offset, and the direction. Different here. When you're programming through the computer, you put in the transmit frequency and the receive frequency, okay? The very first column is labeled FHSS, and there's no explanation what that's for, and it's off everywhere. And when you go in there, it'll automatically set it to off. 
I have no idea what it is. If you do, put something in the comments. Um, no fair making up uh, uh, <laughs> names, but... Uh, Okay, now one, uh, let's see, when programming, you need to specify the repeater's input frequency, the repeater's output frequency. Um, the direction and offset don't have to be set, and in fact, can be anything. Now, note in the USA, again, the 2 meter offset is 00. 0. 0.600. The 70 centimeter offset is 5.000. Okay, the direction of the offset depends on the band plan and and is um, uh, usually specified for a repeater. that will have like 147.195 plus. That means the offset is plus. But here you're going to be, you have to calculate the transmit frequency for the little radio here so that it'll be on the input frequency for the repeater. Okay, as normal, uh, programming via the programming software is just flat easier than doing it from the front panel. Um, and there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, you can do a lot. There's nothing in here that I've seen for the ability to like read a spreadsheet. They claim they have sent information to the people who do Chirp. So Chirp at some point will be able to program this radio. Right now it does not. Now one thing you can do, if someone else has the identical radio, you can uh, save the programming file from one and then write it to yours. Okay. Um, I, I do point out, because they point this out in the marketing literature, that the alpha displays both upper and lower case. Let me talk about the manual. The manual is well written by someone who speaks English well but is not a native speaker. Uh, there are some annoying and even vexing errors, but it is better than most manuals. It, it's been thought through, and it has specific instructions for doing anything, sequences for doing different things. The radio uses VFO and MR nomenclature, VFO and memory recall, which is the Japanese way of doing it. However, the manual states that MR is equivalent to channel mode and VFO is equivalent to frequency mode. Now, the manual sometimes lapses into calling them uh, channel mode and frequency mode. Um, the manual of all things, this is weird, the first half of it is written in English, the second half in German. You would think if they're marketing this to North America, they would have uh, English French and Spanish, or if they're marketing South America, Spanish and Portuguese. Uh, in, now, this may be for, you know, uh, I don't know, European, uh, but there are many, many more languages than German and English over there, so I don't know how they would do that. But the radio itself supports two languages, English and Chinese. If you want to practice your Chinese, you can do it here. I think it's a nice radio. It's solid. It's FM only, so it's basic radio. Uh, there's no DMR, D-Star, whatever. Uh, I recommend it as what I'd call a normally capable FM only dual band handheld. Uh, although I do have objections to the mistakes in the manual. They need to publish an addendum or something. The price is $65 on Amazon. I will put a link uh, here in the video, which is showing right now. I'll also put it below in the text, and we'll also put it on my website with my other Amazon links up there. So that is the radio, a little FM. I'm uh, kind of getting out of the business of doing product reviews, but I keep to seem end up in it. Do I recommend this radio? It's a nice little radio. Once you get past the hangups, in the manual where there are some instructions that will lead you astray. Um, you can easily program from the front channel. I'd write down how to do it and keep it with the radio because you're going to go through a lot of menus to do that. One thing that you can't do from the uh, menu is insert a uh, alphabetic name for the repeater. 
but you can do that uh, from the uh, computer-based programming. So there we go, a whirlwind tour. Uh, this is not part of the reference station per se. I haven't looked at handhelds yet. I will choose a handheld for the reference station. It'll probably be DMR or D-Star or something like that. Also a mobile rig for uh, indoor use in your station. Uh, and uh, as you know, I had a snag on the antennas for the reference station. I've got some more antennas coming. If worse comes to worse, we're going to homebrew. Okay, I want an antenna that covers all of 40 and all of 20. And uh, we'll figure out how to do that. Then maybe two antennas, who knows. They're not that expensive, although you've got to buy cable for each one. So unless we do a fan dipole, we might try that. Um, I like to do Saturday live streams at uh, 1900 UTC on Saturdays. However, I have to say there will not be a live stream on Saturday, March 7th, nor will there be a live stream on the uh, first Saturday in April. On that Saturday, I will be at the Longmont um, Lark Fest, Longmont Amateur Radio Club Fest or Lark Fest uh, in Longmont, Colorado. Uh, and I'll be speaking there probably on um, test equipment for the radio amateur. And uh, we'll go from there. Until we next meet, 73.